And the reason I advocated sure. really heavily for Kickstart on this list is because I think it's like a lost art that is falling away. Because a lot of people's experience with RHEL is virtual machines. And so they use tools like VMware templates to like, they install a machine and then they just make it a template. And then they just yeah. stand it out from their template. But then if you need to like do Amazon stuff, well, how do you go from your VMware template to your Amazon stuff, right? I think that in certain environments, Pixie booting and passing in a kickstart is more efficient than deploying from a template because you get up to the minute deployments. That's the way we did it when I worked in higher ed. We had a bunch of systems. I could deploy a system in minutes because I just handed it off through satellite. Yeah. By the way, satellite can do Pixie and kickstart and build your systems for you. So the other thing I found kind of obnoxious about templating is it encourages us to do silly things. Like we start with one template, but then like, oh, I need a web server. So somebody installs right. GPD and then makes that a template. Yes. And so you end up with this growing pile of template cruft that goes across all your templates because they're the yep. same box been manipulated and jacked with over time. And oh yeah, that guy, he forgot to sysprep the image. And so it's got an old Mac address in the template. If you do Kickstart where you're doing a brand new install, you start with a fresh box and then it's automated which means you don't have to sit there and answer all the questions. If you have a reasonably performant source for your installation media, it takes like 10 minutes. So it's roughly yeah. the same time as a clone of your template in a lot of instances. Right. So one of the reasons it worked so well uh, when I worked in higher ed was we had a bunch of different types of systems we had to churn out. Some of them were web, some of them were like databases. We just had different sized VM definitions that we would deploy to. And we had different layouts in Kickstart. So then there was no base image that we deployed. It would just install my installation medias that I had on the web. And what I wanted to show you here, I, I still can't see the stupid share. Can you see a Kickstart file? <laughs> okay, so this is a Kickstart file. Uh, I wanted to show you this because this came right out of a RHEL 9 installation. Like earlier today, I did a RHEL 9 installation from the DVD. I made some custom choices within the installation wizard. At the other end, when I had the system built, right inside Root's home directory is an anaconda-ks.cfg file. And that's what this file is. You can see here that I did a graphical installation. It, get, it defines some repositories that were run by the, the installation media. You can see here that I told it that it installed from the CD-ROM that it will install from the CD-ROM, right? Because it's that's that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to reproduce the thing that I did manually. And then here's this nice little set of packages. I told it to install a minimal system. I told it to install container management, which adds in like container tools and Podman and whatnot. Uh, you could add in more things here. I don't know. If I wanted to add S-Trace, you literally just, you have to know the package name. Uh, you just put the package name and it'll add it inside of, you see how there's this percent packages. That means that we're in the packages section of the kickstart file. Just add S-Trace and it'll install the latest version of S-Trace. You can even say, I want a specific version. As long as you know the version, you the same way you would do it inside of an RPM, you know, the name of the RPM package. If you did like S-Trace dash 1.2.3, it would install S-Trace version 1.2.3 as long as that's in your repository. Uh, you can see how this there's an at symbol in front of container management. That's because that's a package group. If I wanted to install, I don't know, like virtualization host or something, I would do at virtualization host and it would install that group, right? Yeah. Uh, really cool. Go ahead. You can get that list of groups from uh, DNF group list. I'd have to look up the syntax again, but yes, you can get it from DNF. You can say, what's the groups? This is the other thing. Uh, I defined a custom file system when I did this, or file system layout. And that's the powerful thing about Kickstart. If you have a collection of Kickstarts, say this one needs a larger var, and this one needs a larger opt or serve. You just have a different Kickstart that will define that partition table in a different layout. It'll do the installation and lay out that other partition table. You do have to have some idea of how big the disk you're deploying to is because Kickstart isn't great about doing this dynamically. However, there are commands you can put in here that, ju that just says, okay, lay out these in exactly the sizes that I want. And then you'd have one at the end that says, fill the rest of the disk. So that's about as dynamic as it gets. 
I don't think there's a way to make this like this percentage of the disk and that this percentage of the disk. Maybe you can do math within here. I think there are more advanced ways to use Kickstart that you can do calculations for things like swap size. You can get pretty deep in this kind of stuff. The other cool thing, if you're dealing with satellite, you can define snippets within satellite. So say your disk layout is a snippet. Maybe you have three different disk layouts and you can just call the snippet you want inside of the kickstart file. And there's a bunch of ways you can use snippets like that. Here you can see, I told it to add a user, really helpful. This sets a password for the user. But the other thing I wanted to show you was at the end, so there's two special blocks you can use, one called pre and one called post. And those are literally shell that will run before the installation is pre and after the installation is post. So if I just added a percent post here, and then started adding in, I don't know, like maybe I want to add a user, maybe I want to add an authorized SSH key for the user that I added. If I know how to do that with shell, I can do it here. I can do an MKDIR for like home, Nate, dot SSH, and then I'm not going to do all of this to show it to you, but then you'd change the permissions to make sure it's owned by the right user, and you'd add an authorized keys file, put that in there. Do you want to enable a service at the end? I could do a system CTL enable for like cockpit.service. Now, obviously, I would have had to have installed cockpit, which is not installed by default. So back up in that packages section, I would have had to say cockpit and whatever cockpit plugins I wanted added. I was going to go through and demo an actual installation, but I had trouble getting that going. But I am going to put in the description of today's video a link to our knowledge base articles about how to build, how to get a kickstart file, what some of the syntaxes are, and how to build an ISO, because that's probably the most portable way to use a kickstart file. You can actually bake it into an ISO file. But if you wanted to go full bore and set up a Pixie server and pass off kickstart files, that's a whole other way to get that done. It's a lot more expandable that way. Or so extensible. Scripts that get run as RC local. In the post, I use a here document or cat to create the script contents that gets put into the file system. I yep. can also set it up so that the machine will trigger that when it boots. I did, did have two notes, Nate. One is percent pre is a little bit different than percent post because of how it runs. Percent pre is running in the installer RAM disk but, and it's before your system has been installed, right? So there isn't going to be a home directory yet because it's pre-installation. So you're limited in the commands that you can run to be the ones that are part of the installer RAM disk environment. Um, so I've used it for things like uh, pre-partitioning a disk or clearing yep. a disk before we start yep. partitioning stuff. But it runs in, in like this RAM disk environment. It doesn't affect the machine that comes out the other side. Directly. Yeah, I, I worked with a customer who used pre inside of their Kickstart files to uh, identify the hardware in the machine. Right. So what network adapters do I have? What size is my disk? And then it would make variables out of that, that it could then use later in the kickstart file. That's a really good use for pre. Yep. On the customer portal, there is an application that will validate your kickstart. Once you've made changes, how do you know that it's actually going to work? You could take your file and run it through this validator and it will tell you whether it complies with kickstart syntax or not, and can help you troubleshoot stuff. Um, the other thing is if you don't answer a question in your Kickstart, the installer will ask you. So it may start up the graphical installer and have one question. When you click the answer to that question, then everything else is automated. So I've used that too. Like maybe I didn't know the time zone because somebody right. else was installation. So I would not specify the time zone, which meant that when somebody booted off of my install media and ran the Kickstart, it would start up the GUI and ask them to specify their time zone and click it but then the rest of the installation was automated.